Good morning. My name is Gilad Shani, and I'm a research analyst at Barron Capital following the tech and energy infrastructure sectors. It is my distinct pleasure to introduce our next guest. He is a man who has been identified as everything from a supervillain to a superhero. He doesn't stop at changing our world as we know it. He is on a mission to change our galaxy. Elon Musk. is the CEO of Tesla, a company whose mission is to accelerate the world's transition to sustainable transport. In 2004, Elon was a lead investor in Tesla's first financing round, and in 2008, when the company was near bankruptcy, Elon became CEO and led its growth to over $5 billion of revenue today. The company developed three electric vehicles, the Roadster, Model S, and Model X. The Model S has been described as a remarkable car that paves a new unorthodox course, and it's a powerful statement of American startup ingenuity. Model X, which was recently launched, has a wait time of over a year. Tesla sold almost 100,000 vehicles, electric vehicles, to date. Tesla is building a battery manufacturing plant called Gigafactory that will be 10 times bigger than the largest Boeing facility producing Dreamliners. Interestingly, Tesla is the largest battery consumer in the world, surpassing consumer electronic companies like Samsung and Apple. Elon is a scientist an inventor, a designer, and one of the world's most innovative minds. He is helping to advance some of the world's most disruptive technologies. Tesla in the auto industry, SpaceX in the aerospace industry, and SolarCity in the power industry. Now please welcome Elon and Ron for a conversation. That's pretty cool. So when I started my career, one of my first clients told me that what was most important uh, was finding someone uh, who could realize a dream, make it happen. Uh, and that's been my whole career, finding people in which to invest and whom to invest. Uh, I was with Eric uh, Schmidt recently. He's a chairman of Google, and he's one of uh, Elon's best friends. And uh, he was telling me that he regards Elon as a combination of Walter Chrysler and Thomas Edison. And I didn't really know very much about Walter Chrysler until I looked him up on Google, and, and <laughs> pretty interesting to be compared to those two guys. So, uh, so, so again, keeping with the theory about investing in people, uh, so we're investing in you. And, uh, and, and I think when we were talking about $5 billion in revenues, uh, I'm sure you believe this is just the very beginning. So, so I'd like to touch a little bit before we get into the business on your background. We just started to talk about that before. So you came from South Africa. Your dad was an engineer. Mm -hmm. And your mother? Um, my mother's a model and a nutritionist. And one of your brothers worked with you? Yeah, we co-founded the first company together. And so, so Elon uh, was also a founder of, you know, he's had these games and uh, electronic games and then uh, he was a founder of PayPal, uh, sold his business to PayPal, and PayPal got sold, went public seven, eight hundred million dollars, sold it for a billion two, eBay bought it, ultimately 50 billion. So uh, presumably that has some impact on the way you think about things. Yeah, absolutely. Um, I, I, actually, I, 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 w I actually was against the sale. I wasn't uh, in favor of the sale, but um, I was, um, I, 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 I was largest you know, owner of, of PayPal at the time, but I only had like 12%, and so everybody else really wanted to sell, so we went forward with that. Um, but I think, um, I think we probably shouldn't have. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> um, so, so I was reading about your history, and, and we've spoken before, obviously, 
and about uh, your interest in space and uh, uh, sustainable transport and solar energy. Where did all this come from? Well, uh, when I was in college, I thought about um, what would most affect the future of humanity, and uh, I wanted to be involved in, in those, at least some of those areas. And I, th I thought there'd be, there be there were five things that I that I came up with that I thought would really affect our, our future as a civilization. Um, one of them was the internet, um, and then uh, the other was. Uh, sustainable energy, both production and consumption of, of that. And the third was um, making life multi-planetary. Um, and the fourth and fifth were uh, genetics and, uh, and AI. Um, and I didn't think I'd be involved in, in those areas, but I just, those sort of more in the, in the abstract of what I thought would, have, would affect things. Um, and. Um, but I mean, going back a little further, I actually didn't really expect to be uh, involved in creating companies when I was like uh, in high school or you know uh, middle school. Um, I actually was going to uh, um, pursue sort of physics and a career in physics and try to sort of understand more about the nature of the universe. Um, but um, you know, then things like the superconducting super collider got cancelled, and I thought, well, you know, like, what if I'm stuck in some situation like that, and then there's like some active government basically stops things, and then uh, th then then I, I would it would all be a waste. So, so, so when it, when I think about the cars, and so obviously, you know, if you're using hydrocarbons and burning them and wrecking the environment, it makes it tough to live on Earth. And as you pointed out, unless we adapt and can start to breathe carbon dioxide, and so. So, so, so that's your effort there. But yeah, uh, actually, it, it, the, the thing is that um, my, in, in college, um, my interest in sustainable energy was purely, what, what, at the time, was, was really from the standpoint of, of, of uh, us eventually running out of hydrocarbons to mine and burn. So there's, there's, a, there's obviously a limited supply of oil in the ground, um, and, and eventually we would have to transition to something that's sustainable. Um, because it, when we're drawing oil from the ground, we're, we're essentially taking the accumulated uh, solar energy that was bound up in plants and animals, and then over hundreds of millions of years uh, was turned into oil. Um, and, and, and that's, that's obviously finite, and if, uh, we're, if, we, if we run out of that and don't have a good solution, then there would be economic collapse, uh, independent of any environmental concerns. Um, and so that was actually what, what sort of initiated my interest in sustainable energy. Uh, and it's sort of tautological. I mean, if, if you know, it, energy needs to be sustainable if it's going to last for the long term. Um, and then uh, over time, it became apparent that there, there was actually an even more pressing concern, which is that we're quite materially changing the chemical constituency of the oceans and atmosphere. Um, and the way that humanity has kind of grown up around the world is that um, you know, we, we've put so much of our, so many of our cities and settlements and towns right along the coastline, um, and uh, you know, and, and, and the, the world is quite sort of delicate in in, in these sort of chemical balance. And so, that if, if we do take trillions of tons of uh, CO2 that was buried deep underground and has been since, in a lot of cases, since the Precambrian era, um, you know, when the most sophisticated thing was like a sponge. Then that would be it would be a bad experiment to run. So so it seems so obvious, and we have all these car companies that make all these cars every year that burn gasoline, and nobody wanted to do anything. But why? 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 So it's so obvious. You know, you read in evidence, and Exxon was in the paper about the impact that they're having on the environment, and they hit it, just like. The cigarette companies in 1964. Yeah, just like the cigarette companies. Same exact thing, right? It's, it's the they, same same playbook. In fact, the crazy thing is, um, I'd recommend reading the book uh, Merchants of Doubt, because um, they actually explored um, some scientists at JPL and, and and elsewhere. They sort of explored like, well, what's going on here? And they actually found that the, uh, I mean, the oil and gas industry is actually using literally the same lobbyists as the tobacco industry, like by name, not even the firm. 
Amazing. Like some of those guys are still, they're still going. Amazing. Um, yeah, so, I mean, and, and just like... But they learned how to do it. Yeah, absolutely. Um, and, and then, uh, oddly enough, the, the one movie I was involved with making was a movie called Thank You for Smoking, uh, which I recommend watching. It's kind of a fun movie. <laughs> um, and, and you, but but it, it, it's sort of, um, it's, it's based on, on Buckley's book, and it's, uh, it, it's, 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 it really gets to the truth of the matter of like how, how all this happens. Um, and what they do is essentially exploit doubt. Um, and so, even when you've got a situation where virtually every scientist uh, on Earth agrees that this is, you know, that, that, that global warming is real, that adding um, billions of tons of carbon to the atmosphere and oceans is, is a bad idea, then you have a few percent of who, who dissent, and, and then the way that it is, pre it is presented to the public is, is not that, you know, 97 or 98 percent of scientists think what we're doing is crazy, but that but simply that scientists disagree. Now, now scientists disagree about a everything. <laughs> okay, you will not find 100% of scientists who agree about anything. Um, so, that, but, but this is a very disingenuous argument. So, so, so I understand that. And then I go to visit your plant, and I've been there go every three or four months now. And I guess not very many people who are analysts on Wall Street, even though 22 guys publish about Tesla, I think very few have actually been there, and hardly anyone's spoken to you. But then when I go into the plant, and I see, and I've been to other automobile plants also, and there's a lot of people, not that many machines, and I see our plant in Tesla, and I see a lot of machines and not that many people. Uh, and I look at it, and it appears to me so Herculean. How do you build such a thing, and how could you ever think you're going to be successful? Why, how would you do such a thing? And then to well, start up, you're sure. a poor immigrant kid, you come here and you do, how do you do that? How'd that work? Uh, sure, well, I mean, at the beginning of Tesla, um, I didn't think we would be successful. I thought we would almost certainly fail. Um, and you put all the money you had in PayPal to, to invest in this, and you thought you'd fail. Yeah, um, I mean, <laughs> <laughs> I mean, I could, I could walk you through the basic logic of, I mean, how, 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 so, um, coming out of PayPal, I was fortunate enough to have about $180 million, um, and I thought, well, that's, that's a lot of money. Um, you know, if, if, if I, I, I'm going to assign half of this to SpaceX, Tesla, and SolarCity, and then I'll still have the other half, and I'll be fine. Um, and, yeah, but you told your wife if it doesn't work when you live in, your, in, her, in her parents' basement? I, I did, yeah. <laughs> I was, yeah, hopefully kidding, because it's like, it's not, it's not great in her parents' basement. <laughs> it's really not great. Uh, yeah. So, uh, yeah. Yeah, she didn't like that. Um, but, but, I mean, the way things, so I thought, yeah, you know, so I've, I figure I'd probably lose the money, but, be, you know, a good try, and it's kind of important and um, worth doing. But, but then, as time went by, and the companies needed more money, and then we had that really tough recession of 08 to 09, um, which was super bad for the car industry. I mean, you had GM and Chrysler go bankrupt. Uh, so I was like, man, uh, if, if I don't invest everything, if, if, if I invest everything, there's a, there's a chance um, and that we'll, su we'll survive. If I don't invest everything, there is no chance. So if it wasn't for that recession, there's no way this could have existed. Being able to buy a billion dollar plan for $50 million. Oh, oh that's true. But that came, that came a bit later, but yeah. Um, but the, the, the real key thing was, was 2008. Well, even maybe if you go from mid-2007 to mid-2009, that two-year period was super bad. Um, and we'd made so many mistakes in the beginning of Tesla that we basically had to recapitalize the company almost completely in 2007. Um, because, I mean, almost every decision we'd made was wrong. Um, so, and, and when we created the company, and, and I've got to give credit here for the beginning for um, uh, AC Propulsion, which is a little, little company in uh, Southern California who created an electric sports car. Um, and it was actually based on, on, on AC Propulsion sort of idea. It, but I was trying to convince AC Propulsion to commercialize an electric sports car. 
uh, commercialize this sort of prototype that they'd done, but they had no interest in doing that. Um, and uh, after a while, I got tired of trying to convince them, and so I said, look, I'm just going to do this myself. And then and they said, well, you know, there's some other people that also want to do it. Do you want to join in with them? I said, okay, let's, let's do that. Um, and, uh, but I, th those guys don't get enough credit. They, they, uh, they did some cool stuff with an electric sports car before Tesla did. So that's, with, that's when you were thinking about, should we use an engine and an electric, or should we just use electric? Oh, no, that, that, was, that was pure electric sports car. Um, I mean, the whole sort of saga of Tesla is quite complex, and it's like many soap opera episodes that you could make out of it. Um, but, but no, that, that AC Propulsion had created a, um, a pure electric sports car uh, called the T0 um, as kind of just a demo, uh, but they were just not interested in commercializing their, their stuff. And um, so I said, okay, look, this really needs to, we need to show people broadly what electric cars can do. So um, ended up getting, getting to with a bunch of guys and trying to commercialize that idea. So again, so we go back to this plant, this massive plant that we have out in Fremont, California. Today, yeah. I never expected that we'd have this plant. But it's an amazing place. Yeah. And the amazing thing is, like, it's kind of full, which is, I mean, it, when, when, I, when we got in there, we thought, like, when we first got that, that plant, it's this, one of the biggest plants in the world. Um, I think it's sort of, like, by footprint, I mean, I think it's, like, maybe the third or fourth biggest how many, how many square feet? It's five and a half million square feet. Five and a half million. Yeah. So that's what, a hundred and how many acres? It, you mean under roof? Uh, it's, 150 it's, it's, acres? Yeah, exactly. Um, it's a General Motors building. Just to give you perspective, General Motors building, which is where the Apple store is, that one block, that's one acre. This is 150 acres. Yeah. It's crazy. You could go camping in there. Um, and, uh, like, it takes you a long time to work for, walk from one side to the other. Um, <laughs> We have bikes in the factory, so you can just get around a bit faster. Um, and uh, when, when we first got this, um, which was actually, it was a little bit later, it was in um, early 2010. Um, and uh, we thought, man, there's no way we'd ever get that, that, that awesome plant because, um, you know, it just costs too much. Um, and we didn't, have much, we didn't have much money. But then, as a result of the recession, um, the, the plant, which was joint owned by uh, GM and uh, Toyota, um, the, they decided to close it down. Um, uh, and the story behind that is sort of a long story, independent of Tesla. So they were going to shut it down, and it was just going to be empty, and they was like maybe going to turn it into like a mall or something like that. Um, and, but it was going to be empty for a long time. And, um, and, and anyway, so, so we sort of approached uh, Toyota and said like, look, um, you know, we'll take it off your hands, you know. <laughs> uh, and, um, and, and then uh, and then we also did a bunch of other strategic elements. That the, the strategic elements we did with Toyota were actually independent. We also did a, an electric RAV4 program, and then Toyota also um, did an investment at the IPO. Um, so, and they invested at the IPO of $50 million, $50 million at a $17 share price. So it worked out for them, um, but um, but we were amazed that, that they were willing to move forward uh, and, and do it. Um, and uh, but for us, at, at Tesla was so tiny at the time. I mean, it was like imagine like you're like a, this little band, this little group, and this like somebody says, well, there's this giant like alien dreadnought that you can you know you can have for pennies on the dollar, and you have no idea how it works. And you're like. Like, where are the, where are the controls? <laughs> how, do, how do you use this thing? Um, and that, that's what we, um, you know, we were fortunate enough to, to, to buy it at a point where automotive plants were not worth much. So this plan ultimately is going to be able to do a half a million cars a year? I think, I think half a million cars, and you know, we could conceivably go beyond half a million cars though. But that's not really the dream. I mean, long term, I think, I think we want to try to do several million cars. Um, yeah, I mean, from volume standpoint. But we're now doing 50,000 this year and 75,000 next year, and we're talking about several million. And but we think about Volkswagen, 10 million, Toyota, 10 million, General Motors, eight or nine million. Mm -hmm. 
profit margins a fraction of what we think we can do, why yeah. can't we be bigger than them? Well, I mean, I guess. I mean, that's pretty possibly. Pretty possibly. It's not out of the question. Um, I think over time, if we continue to, if we build great products um, and we, we keep our cost structure uh, competitive, um, then I think, uh, you know, who knows what the ultimate. So we're going to need a lot of these plants? Yes. Many plants. In fact, many auto plants and many gigafactories, I think, are needed. So the gigafactory, let's do that one. So gigafactories in Nevada, yeah. and, they, and this is $4 billion, $5 billion. It's, we're expecting it to be a roughly a $5 billion uh, capital investment to get to full production. Um, although te Tesla is providing you know, roughly 50, 60 percent of that um, over time, and then our strategic partners like Panasonic and a number of others are providing the other half, and roughly. Then, and then Nevada gave us a billion or in tax credits or sa savings or something? Um, the, yeah, I mean, the whole tax credit thing drives me crazy. Um, <laughs> it, it, it sounds, well, we're not going to turn it back. <laughs> yeah. It, it sounds much better than it is. Um, so, actually, the first time I heard that the, that the amount was 1.3 billion was at the press conference announcing the deal, and I was like, "Really? How did we get to 1.3?" Um, the w what we actually got was um, Nevada gave us uh, some free land, um, but, but the state of Nevada has a lot of land, so this is not a <laughs> it's not in short supply. Like the desert. Um, yeah, there's a lot of land in Nevada, in Nevada, um, as I said. Um, and then they also agreed to build a connecting highway on the southbound uh, to, that connects to Carson City. But they were going to do that anyway, so I don't think like, that should be included in, our, in what they gave us. <laughs> um, <laughs> like, um, and then they repurposed, uh, I think, uh, I don't know, $80 million of tax credits that was going to the like, insurance, comp insurance companies or something. They repurposed that to us. Uh, but uh, that, that's the only sort of thing that we can actually monetize. Um, and, then, um, and, and then they also gave us uh, relief on um, sales and use tax for equipment in the factory. Uh, and depending upon what type of uh, situation, it's either 10 or 20 years for the sales and use tax abatement. Um, so but, so if, if you assume that we, we fully use the sales and use tax abatement, which requires building, which requires actually capital equipment in excess of $5 billion over 20 years, and you add all of that up, it, it adds to $1.3 billion. So, so it's, really it's really 1.3. <laughs> yeah, no, actually, in, in effect, the, the contribution, the initial contribution to the factory, um, the Gigafactory by the state of Nevada is less than 5%, and then, they're, and then they have roughly a 1% contribution over 20 years. So, so presumably, for them, this is a great deal because they're getting a lot of jobs. Oh, it's a no-loss proposition for the state. I mean, uh, you know, like, as the saying goes, the house always wins. And, like, Nevada understands the house, okay? <laughs> Nevada is the house. <laughs> so, it, it, it's, like, the, the only way for us to actually have, have the sales and use tax credits be meaningful is... Uh, if for us to have enormous numbers of machines and enormous numbers of people operating those machines. Um, and, Which and is good for Nevada. In, in Nevada's calculation was that, they, that, they would, that their return on their tax credits would be somewhere between 80 and 100. Not percent. <laughs> Times. Times. So it's, like, it's, a, it's a good deal for the state. So, um, so, so the, the battery plant, that's what the Giga plant is. Uh, is being done uh, without a lot of, without any, I, I understand, uh, public viewing of what we're doing inside of the factory. And there were some reporters. There will, there will, yeah, there will be some. But yeah, yeah. So far. Yeah, yeah. And there have been some reporters, I guess a couple or three weeks ago, uh, that snuck into our property. Yeah, and like ran over two of our people. And tried to kill us. <laughs> yeah. Kill our guys. Um, yeah, that was pretty crazy. Um, kind of. Um, Why? Well, I think they just got a bit overzealous, and then, and then I, I assumed that they panicked and weren't actually trying to kill our employees, but, but they, they did run over to our, to our employees, which is what, you know, while they were trying to, they were trying to get away, um, uh, and so they ran over to our guys. And like, unfortunately, like, the injuries aren't too serious, but, um, but yeah, that's, that's like not cool. Um. So, so, 
you know, so, so we think it's important enough to not let anyone see what we're doing inside and other people trying to figure out what's going on. And it's obviously not a nightclub. And uh, so, so, what is, so what I think about is not knowing very much about technology and how things work is that, so we're, so we're making that kind of a battery, mm -hmm. lithium. Lithium, yeah. Although the, the general rubric of lithium covers many types of chemistries. I mean, um, there's a really broad range of things, of batteries that use lithium as the ion transport. So whatever you describe here is, is going to go over my head, but my question is, how do we know when we're making such an investment that what we're building in that factory is going to persist, and why is it that in a hundred years, so we do all sorts of things, you're sending things out of the atmosphere, out of the galaxy, out of the universe, planes, and, and, uh, and yet, for a hundred years, we haven't been able to build a battery that goes for more than 300 miles. So how can that be? How, how is it possible that we haven't been able to spend money on that? And if that's the case, because no one's paid attention to it, and all of a sudden we come along and pay attention, we're going to try to reduce the weight in the existing batteries and use maybe silicon and having a 300 mile battery going right. to 1,000. Oh, yeah. So how do we worry that what we're building isn't going to get obsolete also? Uh, well, the, the reason is that at this point, I think we, we have quite a good understanding of all the battery technologies uh, in the world. Um, like there could be some small laboratory that's being super secret, um, but, uh, but generally what people inventing battery technologies try to do is they approach Tesla first and foremost because we're the biggest lithium ion consumer in the world. So anyone who wants to build a battery has new ideas, they're going to come to us before they go anywhere like else. We'd be their biggest customer. So if somebody invents something, the, the, the obvious choice to license it to or is, is Tesla. Um, and so, um, and, and, and we try to take things, you know, as seriously as possible, but I mean, we, we track uh, right now about 60 different uh, efforts around the world to develop and improve batteries. Um, and, you know, some of them hold some long-term promise, but uh, we, and we, but we rate all of them on from a one to five, um, where five is we should be doing business with them, and one is complete BS. Um, How many fives are there? <laughs> there's no fives. <laughs> um, there's some. There's some threes. Uh, currently, there's no no one in the. There's no one even in the four. Like we, there's some that might go from a three to a four. Four means we should we should be in like preliminary discussions. So what's, uh, what's going to change in the technology that's going to enable us to have this different, are we going to have something in 10 years that's going to be an unusual battery that's going to be able to do a thousand miles and going to weigh less than it does presently? I don't think we'll have quite it's going to be different that much chemistry. of an improvement. Um, and, and, and actually I think most likely we would not, like, like technically right now for us to do say a 500 mile range car, we could absolutely do that right now. Uh, with current, current batteries, but, but the, the cost would be too high and the useful load impact on the vehicle would be too high. So you'd have, we'd have to fill up part of the trunk and the front, and the, the front trunk and the rear trunk uh, with batteries. Um, we'd have to impinge a little bit on passenger room, but for us to do a 500 mile range car right now would be no problem. Um, a 500 mile range car in the current uh, form factor, um, I think that's you know, probably less than 10 years away, you know, in the same volume and roughly the same mass. And the way we're going to drive the cost of the kilowatt hours from 250 to 100, that's because we're doing what? That's just because we're doing scale, because we're using different materials, because we're changing chemistry. How do we do that? Yeah, so we're, we're making quite substantial improvements in the total pack energy density. So there's, there's, there's the cell energy density, and then as you put those cells together in a pack and you have to figure out how to do that safely, um, it w we're able to reduce the pack energy density. So we'll make, I think, quite significant improvements in the, in the pack energy density. Um, but, but the thing that's most important, really, is the cost. Um, because I mean, for a lot of people that are driving Model S, um, you know, the, the, model, the, the current, say, uh, dual motor Model S will do over 300 miles right now at 65 miles an hour. Um, so that's, that's more than enough range for most people. It's, and then you've got the supercharger where you can recharge very, you know, very quickly. Uh, we have a supercharger network that's now ubiquitous throughout the country. You can, so the, lots of our customers do 
cross-country trips, LA, New York, um, whatnot, uh, using a supercharged network. So there's really, you have, you have freedom of travel at this point, um, and certainly incremental improvements to the battery pack range are important, but the thing that's really important is reducing the cost per kilowatt hour. Um, so the... And we can do that with existing. We could, yes. Yes, we are going to make some uh, technology improvements as well to the fundamental cell chemistry um, and certainly to the way that the uh, battery modules and packs are organized. But uh, the fundamental focus is on um, cost per unit of energy. And uh, that, that's, so that, that's what the Gigafactory is about. It's, it's, it's taking economies of scale um, as, fa as far as we can we can possibly imagine to, to a very extreme level. As far as we can, that's what gets it to 100, or that's what gets it lower than 100. To, to sorry, 100 what? 100 dollars a kilowatt. Oh, right. um, we um, can't comment on exact price numbers, but but, but uh, I mean that's not that that's that's approximately you know it's in, that's in the ballpark of what we're aiming for, um, and, and and that's it's important to cut the, the essentially the cost per kilowatt hour at least by 30% with the Gigafactory, and our aspiration, of course, is to do better than a 30% cost per kilowatt hour reduction. In, in order to achieve the 50% cost reduction for the Model 3, which is about a 20% smaller car, um, and so would require, for the same range, 20% pure, uh, you know, less energy, that, that means to get to the full 50%, we need another 30 points coming from economies of scale, um, which I'm, I'm actually very confident we'll achieve. Um, and, and, and at the Gigafactory, we're, what we're doing is consolidating the production of the pack all the way from the, the raw materials. So there's literally cars coming in from, from the mines, like rail cars of raw materials from the mines, and then out come completely finished battery packs. Um, and this has actually never been done before, uh, So this, it, for, for batteries at least. Um, and uh, what we're able to, 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 to do in this process is massively imp improve the the, the, the cost of the of the of the, of the cells and the packs, um, because today, if you were to trace the movement of the raw materials from when they're mined, and, and they go through the various refining steps around the world, and eventually are put in a cell, and then that cell eventually is put into a module and a pack, and then put into a car, and then delivered to somebody, the the the, the, the raw material that molecule from the mine is doing an around the world trip like three times. It's, it's really crazy. Um, and there are even steps in the process where um, it is converted first into one. So that's a big opportunity for efficiency. It's, it's, yeah, yeah, huge, huge. So, so one of the things, so Jeffrey Katzenberg, is someone who I'm friendly with, and he had a well-publicized accident uh, in, in his Tesla car a week ago, or two weeks ago, or a month ago, when someone went through a stoplight and a big SUV and hit him at uh, 40 miles an hour, and he says that uh, the test of the car saved his life. And he said, because of the crushed zones, I guess, and, uh, and he said it was just the most amazing thing. So, so here, this guy, well-known, great publicity. Then there's something on the internet that says that uh, someone was just driving a car along and the car was about to smash into them, and the car, and he didn't see it, and the car saw it and stopped, turned around and stopped. Right. And, and so, so here we have this safety, much safer car than the other cars. Yes. And uh, Tom Frisker, I presume you know him, mm -hmm. and uh, his mom, Cindy, uh, Tom, goes, Tom, Tom is in his 60s, and uh, his mom, Cindy, I don't know how, I guess she won't say how old she is, but she's more than 60s. <laughs> at, <laughs> and so he drove his car to her house, and uh, she said, I like this car, and so she kept the car. <laughs> <laughs> and so, so one of the things that's interesting to me is that it just you talk about safety, but you don't really say, you know, your promotion isn't, this is the safest car ever. I mean, I know you say it, but isn't that an unbelievable opportunity to, uh, to promote to change the demographic yeah. of who's buying our car and to get more Cindy's buying, Cindy Priskers sure. instead of Tom's or instead of Tom's children? Um, yeah, it's, uh, glad you mentioned that. In fact, um, in designing the, the Model S and the Model X, uh, safety was our absolute paramount goal. Um, 
And, you know, I mean, my, my, I, mean I felt like obviously my family will be in the car, my friends' families. Um, if, if, if I didn't do everything possible to maximize safety and something went wrong, I couldn't live with myself. So, um, so you know, we, we spent an enormous amounts of time on safety. Um, and, 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 and the whole car is architected for, for maximum safety. Um, and, and, and we have we have physics on our side here, which is very very important. Uh, so, the, the, and I'll just go briefly. Like, why exactly is the car safe? Because you hear things like cars are five stars and all that. But I mean, this this, this five stars that's not an actual statistical number. It, like, statistic, you know, safety statistics are not measured really in stars. They're, they're, <laughs> Um, <laughs> the, 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 there's an actual probability uh, of, of injury, which is that that's the number that's most important. And, and the probability of injury, um, you, you can look it up, it's sort of buried in the, in the, the Department of Transport website, but they have this... For each individual car? Yeah, every, every car has a, a, a combined probability of injury. Um, and uh, the, the Model S um, is still, uh, even though we did it three years ago, it still has the lowest probability of injury of any car ever tested. Um, and that's just on passive safety, and then we have the active safety as well. Um, and the, the, um, the reasons basically are that because the, the car does not have a big steel engine block in the front, it, we have a front trunk as well as a rear trunk, because the electric motors are so small that they're actually coaxial with the, with the axles. So wh when you have a, a high-speed frontal collision, uh, what really matters is force over distance. You know, it's just like jumping into a pool from a, from a high if you, you know, if you jump from, from a high diving board or something into a pool, um, you'd want a deep pool and one without rocks in it. Um, and, and, and <laughs> it's, it's, it's really not that complicated. <laughs> it's the same thing for a car. And, and what people don't realize is like, they think you think of like having a steel engine block is protecting you, except that if, when you hit something, you're going 60 miles an hour. <laughs> so it's stopping you that is important. And so that deceleration distance is incredibly important. Um, or, or described another way, the, the length of the crumple zone is extremely important. And the crumple zone on the front of the Model S is two to three times greater than that of any other premium sedan, which means that the uh, impact attenuation is two to three times greater. Um, and then, anyone with a family, they want to buy one of these cars instead of a gasoline car. <laughs> Absolutely, <laughs> definitely. Um, if, uh, I mean, if, if uh, this is, uh, if, if safety is of, of concern, I would, for sure, I mean, it's just objectively true. It, it is the safest car by far. The, the, the accident that uh, um, uh, Jeffrey was in, where he was, he was sort of um, T-boned by a, 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 an SUV, um, it's, so that's a side impact collision. The, the reason the side impact collision on the, the S is so much better than another car is because the the main structural component is the battery pack in the floor plan. So the battery pack in the floor plan effectively acts as a big shear plate uh, to transfer load uh, from a side impact into the rest of the car so, so that the whole car moves, moves sideways uh, in, in, a, in a side impact collision. Um, the, the, uh, but what happens in a, in a gasoline car, again, because you've got the big steel engine block in the front, you've got a huge portion of the mass in the front, so you've got um, and, and, and the rest of the car is, is relatively weak. You essentially have um, just uh, thin sheet metal in, in the, on, this, on the side of the car and in the floor pan of the car. So uh, the, the, the effect of side impact, the load transfer um, for a, a gasoline car um, to the rest of the mass of the car is weak, and as a result, the side impact distance is dramatically greater. Um, the, the net, net result is that you are much safer in a side impact. Um. So, so I'll just do a couple more questions and I'll open it up for everyone else. But with, so uh, safety, SpaceX, and Uber. So, so safety, with all these other automobile companies having one safety issue after another, not just this emission uh, problem, but also about brakes and about, igni uh, I'm sorry, uh, yeah, the emissions, not, not just about brakes and about um, batteries and I'm sorry, uh, uh, gasoline tanks. Uh, why, so when we have a car that's uh, existing that is for, uh, spoiling the atmosphere, in addition to that, it's not as safe, 
why don't you think people have moved more rapidly to adopt our technology, which we've offered to give them for free? Oh, you mean with the patent survey? Yeah. Um, I think that actually that there are a number of companies using the patents. So it's starting. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. So that's one. Question number two is uh, uh, space, SpaceX, and we'll come back to Uber. So SpaceX. So when I was a kid, there was a television program called Captain Video, and uh, <laughs> Channel Five. <laughs> and the rocket would go up and it would fly around and come back. And, and then in the 1960s, we started going to, you know, to orbit and go to the moon. And, uh, and, and the rockets, as they would take off, the stage one after another would fall off. Like, you know, and, and my first thought when that was happening, I didn't really understand why that would happen. Sure. And now your idea is that, hey, this rocket ship's going to stay together and we could do 99 trips instead of one or something like that and therefore we can do it for one or two or three percent as expensively as we did it before. Why didn't anyone think of that before? Uh, well, actually, the, the, in the um, rocket industry, people have thought about uh, reusability for, for a very long time. Um, and um, it, 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 it just happens that Earth's gravity is quite strong, and um, we're, it, it's just barely possible to get um, reasonable payload to orbit um, with an expendable rocket. Um, so then if you add reusability, um, then that tends to give it negative payload to orbit, so you can't... So how do you do it? So you've got to do two things. Um, you've got to uh, really advance the, the, the core rocket technology itself as far as the engines, the airframe, um, the avionics, um, the recovery systems, um, like landing legs, uh, and uh, the, the, the boost back capability. Um, you, you've got to um, make, make the rocket such that if it was uh, in a pure expendable mode, it would get approximately four or slightly more than four percent of its payload mass to orbit. And, and, and to put this into perspective, normally a rocket gets about two percent of its payload mass to orbit. So it's a very small number. Um, but but if, if so, if you can push that to two-ish percent to more like uh, four percent on an expendable basis, and then be really efficient in the way that the uh, reuse takes place, such that the reuse penalty is only maybe half of that. So you still have a net payload to orbit of two percent. That, that's essentially the what's needed to achieve reusability. Um, and um, and it, I mean, SpaceX has been at it now for 13 years, uh, and we haven't yet achieved it. So. Um, uh, and I, so I think what we've done thus far is evolutionary, not revolutionary, but I think we're within sort of shooting distance of this. I think within, um, I think within the next year, we'll be able to uh, land the rocket intact. We'll be able to land the rocket, just not intact. Uh, <laughs> it's like, there's some exciting videos on YouTube if you want to watch them. Um, and. Uh, but, but I think we're, we're, we're close to landing it intact, um, and then we need to examine the rocket once we get it back to see what needs to be strengthened, uh, where do we over-strengthen things that we don't need to add as much mass, and then we'll be able to do reusability uh, with, the, uh, with the rocket. Um, and, the, and, and just like some of these things are maybe not, not they're not obvious to, to people who aren't, aren't familiar with the rocket industry, but the cost of our rocket is to, to build it. Um, is $60 million, and the, uh, the, but the cost of the propellant, uh, the fuel and oxygen and so forth, is only about uh, $250,000. Wow. Um, or maybe $300,000, thereabouts. But it's basically, uh, um, yeah, it's, it, it's only as, about as expensive as, say, fueling up a 747. Okay, my last question uh, is Uber. So I listened to your conference call and uh, someone asked whether we could be like Uber, and I won't ask you that, but... but <laughs> been asked that a lot. Yeah, because you, you always say, oh, can't yeah. comment on that, I'm not ready to make any announcements in that area. But my question is, so there's another company, it's much smaller than Uber, called Lyft. Mm -hmm. And uh, I guess it's uh, Carl Icahn is an investor in that, and I think Len Blavatnik is too. And so my question is that what is it about Uber's business uh, that will make them immune from being an attacked, attacked 
by Lyft? Does Lyft have a chance against Uber? Oh, wow. I, I'm not really an expert in that uh, arena. I mean, is there some kind of scale that they have that makes it impossible for someone <coughs> to compete against them is really my question? I, I, I think there's probably, uh, I, think pro I mean, this is, I'm, I've spent no time thinking about it, but my impression, <laughs> this is an impression with like low confidence, is that there's, there's room for both Uber and Lyft. Yeah, that's what I, I, I can see. Uh, okay, so, so Elon, I'll take some questions now. Is that okay? Yeah, sure. No problem. And, uh, and then afterwards, uh, I'm sure that, you know, you have, there's a couple of Teslas out on the mall, and I'm not getting a commission to sell them, but, but uh, if you sign up for a, uh, a test drive, then, and we know about it, then we will send you a, a, pr a present. So you can get that afterwards. But in the meantime, questions? Oh. I should mention, I guess got reminded, um, that, that there's actually, um, for, for anyone that isn't able to do a test drive today, uh, we've actually arranged a, a special uh, VIP uh, URL, um, just, just for you guys, uh, which is uh, teslamotors.com slash baron. Wow, cool. Yeah, so it's just, uh, yeah. Thank you. Number six. Hi. Um, I had the pleasure of test driving a six, um, an S just the other night. So uh, it was five minutes in New York City traffic, but sweet, yay. <laughs> um, I know you're not saying a whole lot about the Model 3 at this point, but I'm just curious what you're willing to say about the experience of driving a $35,000 or so Model 3 as compared to driving a Model S? Sure. Well, our intent is the Model S and the X will be our kind of uh, premium, sort of high-end cars. Um, and we will try to lead with new technologies um, in the S and the X. Um, so uh, that, that will be the, the advantage of the S and the X. Uh, but the, the, the three will be um, a, a smaller version, so maybe about 20% smaller. Uh, comparable in size to, say, a 3 Series BMW or an Audi A4. Um, and, um, but it's, it's going to have a very similar feel uh, to, to, to the S. Um, and so it'll, it'll be sort of have great acceleration, um, good driving feel, good handling, um, and for the size of the vehicle, uh, great cargo space. Um, yeah, I should mention, like, the, the, the S, because it's got uh, a trunk in the front and a trunk in the back, um, the, the, the actual cargo space of, of the S is anywhere from 50 to 100 percent more than a, typic, than, a, than a gasoline car of the same external dimensions. You're the one. Thank you so much for joining us. I think that is uh, fantastic. I think uh, I, as well as everybody else here, enjoyed hearing you know, from you. And you were indeed a visionary. Uh, I have one observation. Uh, we have a favorite restaurant uh, that has installed about six uh, Tesla charging stations right outside the door. Okay, it's a good restaurant, but uh, I notice they're always full. All those really? charging stations are okay. full. And thinking of the great synergy of, you know, having a, a restaurant, I've got charging stations, and now I get extra business. So I hope they're paying you to put in these, <laughs> uh, these stations. But I, I have, you know, what I want to get to is a technical question. Read an interesting article about in-road charging. You know, take your pick. It can be inductive. It could be RF. Is there any potential for that, okay, in terms of, in, you know, if there is, is Tesla involved or engaged in looking or doing something with that? Thank you. Sure. I, I actually don't, I think that's unlikely to occur. Um, I think it's, it's really going to be just long-range batteries, um, and, then, and, then, and then most charging tends to occur at people's home or business, um, and, and then that's really 80, 90 percent of charging. 10% uh, of charging is long distance, which is what we have the, the superchargers. So you can travel anywhere in the country. Um, actually did this great road trip with, with my kids uh, from uh, LA to Mount Rushmore in South Dakota. Um, so you can travel anywhere in the country, complete freedom. Um, and, um, uh, but, but I think in locations that are 
not home or business and not long distance. That, there, there will be a small amount of charging that occurs, but it's in the sub-5% category. So it's nice to have, but it's not, it's not needed for full utility of the car. Okay, sure. So we, that's, our, that's, our, that's our aspiration, actually, is to put the supercharging stations um, somewhere where you can, you can immediately then go and um, have a, a nice meal and um, grab a coffee and be on your way so that, or, and do some shopping if you want. So. So, yeah. so, so I apologize to everyone. I hogged the time, and I didn't realize that we were running over. I thought that this was the amount of time we could talk, and then there were more time for questions. Would you be able to answer some questions a little bit longer? Yeah, no problem, sure. So, so Elon can stay here uh, for a bit. There's entertainment that's now starting in three venues. Uh, in the left venue, uh, we have uh, Steve Martin and uh, Martin Short for comedy. Uh, on the right venue, uh, we have Michael Buble. And in the center, there's uh, Tony Bennett and Lady Gaga. Oh. <laughs> not, not bad. <laughs> Pretty cool, right? <laughs>